That's right. You heard it here, folks. For bailing out Wall Street over the American people, all of Congress and every president should be shunned. Call the power of the Amish. Right? <laughs> <laughs> We shun them all. Like I understand the irony of bringing Amish people into a technology-related show. I get it. <laughs> Look, I think we could just take all of Congress and every president, and we shun them and send them to like one of Jeff Bezos's islands, right? Like maybe the one <laughs> where where he silently masturbates while an inter intern counts his money for him. Uh, we could send um, them all there. Yeah, he, he probably. He probably does that too. Yeah, I know. Which so yeah, the Nancy Pelosi image earlier, not that bad, right? You guys, huh? <laughs> not that bad now. No. <laughs> no. And welcome to a brand new episode of Fork Full of Noodles. I'm your host, Chris Mohan. Hey, you guys might uh, hear a little bit of laughter in the background of uh, this episode. And as you might know, as you might not know, uh, these episodes are recorded in front of a live virtual audience uh, that you can be a part of. Uh, these shows happen every single Friday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. You can go to my website and grab tickets for the next show that's probably coming up this Friday. That's Friday. You should, why are you waiting for it? Get on those, th those links in the uh, description right now. Check out the shows. Uh, be a part of the live virtual audience. It's one of the ways that I am uh, earning an income considering that I cannot tour as a comedian, which is what I was. I was a full-time touring comedian, and now these virtual shows are one of the ways that I'm earning an income. The other way that you can financially help this show is by becoming a sustaining member or making a one-time donation. Uh, you can do so by going to my website uh, and uh, either d donating directly on my website, uh, becoming a sustaining member via PayPal or Patreon or uh, what's the Bandcamp. I had a weird space moment. Uh, that was weird. Okay, uh, but you can go to my website and check out all of those things. Go to krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. The last thing uh, that I want to mention is that in each of these shows, I'm donating uh, half of the ticket sales to a grassroots organization. Uh, for this episode, we donated to Chicago's independent media organization, Hard Lens Media. Uh, you can check out uh, all of their information in the description below or go to their website, hardlensmedia.com. Uh, and you can also follow them on all the social media uh, platforms, but make sure you check out their Rockfin channel. Uh, Rockfin is the crypto blockchain uh, content creation site that's kind of like Netflix for content creators. And all you have to do is subscribe. It's 10 bucks a month and you help content creators earn money by just watching their, uh, watching their content and subscribing to their page. So make sure you check that out. Uh, once again, uh, it's hardlensmedia.com. For all of my things, it's krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, now, on to the episode. Well, automation is going to decrease the amounts of jobs we have by a lot, right? The prediction is by 2030, over 800 million jobs globally will be replaced by automation, and 73 million of those jobs will be in the United States alone. The issue of unemployment from automation isn't a result of technology, but rather capitalism. Within capitalism, jobs aren't something we really care about. It's kind of a passive relationship to work, right? We do whatever to earn money so that we can go to the mall and buy shit we don't need and make ourselves feel better about that job we don't like, right? Our society believes that you can't make money doing what you love and having a community within work, right? It's drudgery. We work for the weekends and weekends alone. That's all we'll work for. The reality is that the American workplace can be a community and you can and should make money off of what you love. 
like the bosses and the CEOs are doing what they love, right? Wh which is making money off the backs of the working class. So why can't we? Work shouldn't be something you dread, but it should be something that brings you meaning, purpose, and happiness with the paycheck. I think you should still get a paycheck for it. The problem with automation and it isn't the technology or the artificial intelligence, it is capitalism, right? When technological advancements are made with, within capitalism, people get left behind. And you really don't have to look that far to, to see the effects of capitalism on our society. You don't have to look any further than what's going on in the Midwest right now. Galesburg, Illinois became the political poster child for the manufacturing collapse after a Maytag refrigerator plant moved to Mexico in 2004. Hello, Galesburg! The town was a vibrant symbol of American success for decades. Now, Galesburg is representative of America's main street that still hasn't fully bounced back, more than a decade after big manufacturing left. The technology and global competition, they're not going away. Those old days aren't coming back. So what was it like when the plant closed? Well, it was such, it was such a helpless feeling. A former union man in Galesburg, Mike Patrick, told me that automation has been a concern for decades and that the Maytag plant steadily required fewer workers as a result. When they shut down, we had, uh, in the plant, we had around 1,600 people run the same production that we would have been running when we had uh, 4,000. After plant closures, young workers were often able to find new occupations, while older workers retired or struggled to get by. Just down Main Street, Walt McAllister opened a sandwich shop in the year that Maytag closed. His son Stephen is a local college student who runs a news website. As it became more and more real, I think the town got a little desperate trying to find anything to replace. Uh, the the lack the loss of jobs. I just still looking it, for just, manufacturing. In my generation, this town is there is no future for us here, and it doesn't seem like the city really cares because they don't really want to make one, or want, won't even listen to what we believe will make a town that we would want to stay in. Yeah, how does that make you feel? Oh, it's it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. There's a myth that the loss of manufacturing was due entirely to international trade, and numerous politicians have capitalized on anger against foreign governments and workers. We're going to pursue new trade deals that create higher wages and more opportunities for American workers, bringing back those magnificent words, made in the USA. The reality is that automation has also been a major factor. Manufacturing productivity is no longer directly tied to employment. Output is actually at an all-time high, only employment didn't follow. Around 2000, it fell off a cliff. That's automation, and those jobs won't ever come back. Look, towns like Galesburg, Illinois, were built on manufacturing. When the factories left, the capitalists got to reap the benefits, while everybody else was hunting for bootstraps to pull themselves up by. But what happens when the bootstrap factory is also automated? Now I get it. There's probably folks out there, they're saying, Chris, who cares about these middle of nowhere towns, right? They don't matter with their cows and their working class. They're all probably racist anyway. They're the coastal cities, that's where it is, baby. You know, New York City, Chicago, New Orleans, Los Angeles, Branson, Missouri. That's where life is, baby. That's what you want to see. Look, at five years, New York City, probably going to be underwater and will be the new Atlantis due to climate change. Right? Chicago, thanks to automation and the corruption algorithm, will be run by roving gangs of the robot mafia. Los Angeles yeah, will, yeah, will, yeah, it will, Los Angeles will literally be up its own ass. New Orleans will be too drunk to know what's happening. And Branson, Missouri will, uh, Branson, that is going to be the new Broadway. Uh, so I think Branson's going to be fine. I think Branson's going to be all right. I, uh, I had somebody tell me that Branson was like Vegas if Ned Flanders was in charge. That is correct. That is exactly what. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I've been yeah. once. Yakov yeah. Smirnov was playing. Yeah, I did oh. not go see him. Branson is, is a, <laughs> it's a weird little town. <laughs> but here's the thing, right? The fact that Middle America and, and, and the, the, the Rust Belt are a warning sign for the direction that capitalist-driven automation is going to take us. Right? And, and people are concerned about self-driving cars. What they really need to be concerned about is capitalist driving cars. Huh? Am I right? All right. They're not all going to be gold, you guys. All right. Everybody just chill out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right a lot. Look, the, the epicenter of the tech-based displacement that we're seeing is the city of San Francisco, a coastal haven for liberal and progressive politics and home to multimillionaire and grand political theater mistress, Nancy Pelosi, accurately depicted here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you nailed it. That is the accurate depiction. Uh, it will haunt all of your nightmares. Don't look into her eyes. Do not look into too her late. eyes. <laughs> too late. Too late. Too late. Too late. <laughs> I'm sorry. It had to be done. <laughs> but thanks to the rise of tech jobs uh, that involve AI and automation, the income divide in San Francisco is unlike any city in America. And the ones that can afford to live in that city are now the richest of the rich. And those that can't either leave or wind up homeless. And the solutions to help the homeless aren't coming from the tech industry, but just regular, average, working class people. Del Seymour worked his way out of homelessness and founded a group that trains low-income workers and homeless for tech jobs. They've had success stories, but it's an uphill battle. Well, of course, there's frustration and anger on our side. I mean, we're like the little kid in the, in the Dickens uh, 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 novels, a little homeless kid is standing outside the restaurant looking through the window while people are sitting there carving a the steak. That's how we feel every day. Now, all of this can be very easily avoided with one very simple idea, universal basic income. And I get it. I know. I've talked a lot about UBI, but in terms of this capitalist-driven automation, it's a very oh, needed idea. I you going to say robots. No, oh, God. Yeah, well, the robots are <laughs> part of this problem. <laughs> in order to prevent the, the dystopian future uh, that uh, directors like James Cameron have predicted, uh, we're going to need a universal basic income. And if you're unaware of what UBI is, it's basically uh, every citizen of a country gets a flat amount of money that would cover the cost of rent, food, water, health, shelter, and these days I would also say the internet, right? The biggest argument against giving Americans a UBI is that people would stop working despite there being absolutely no proof of that. In fact, when American, the American people received an additional $600 a week in unemployment. A Yale study found that a majority of people didn't stop looking for work. And even the Chicago Federal Reserve came to the same conclusion as they deposited their trillions in handouts from the Democrats and Republicans. <laughs> I, got, I think like if the Fed can figure out that taking care of Americans' financial needs is a good thing. It should kind of be a no-brainer considering that the Fed comes from no brains at all. <laughs> UBI works, it's successful. The it Canadians does. have got it though. Yeah, and see the Canadians got one that works. They Don't have one that works, yeah. <laughs> so there we go. But here, I think, I think our culture treats money like it's the perfect drug, right? Each week we'll do damn near anything to get that sweet, sweet paycheck, right? We get that hit and then we keep coming back for more. And then when we can't, we get desperate and we just start walking around going, I'll suck your dick for a dollar. Just let me, <laughs> just let me see that old Washington, please. Right? Most of us are like, no, that's called prostitution and it's illegal in this Christian nation, okay? <laughs> You can whore for money, but you can't be a whore for money. You guys get it? But here's I the see what you did there. Ah, thank you. I appreciate it. One person, everybody else is groaning in their seats. I get it. 
But here's the thing, not, not just all this uh, unemployment stuff is proof that UBI will work. We have even more proof that it works and, and not just in these you know, socialist countries like Canada. It, it can work right here in the United States and universal basic income wouldn't de-incentivize work. In 1982, in that socialist state we call Alaska, they implemented a permanent universal basic income. It was called the Alaskan Permanent Fund, and it taxed the oil under Alaska. And if the oil companies want to drill, they would have to pay for it. To make it simple, they taxed the oil that was found underneath the soil and water of Alaska, very rich deposit worth billions and billions of dollars. They taxed it a small tax on it, to produce a fund. And the fund was then invested. And the idea was these are the resources of the state of Alaska. Nobody put them there uh, that's living or that's around today or ever for that matter. And so it's in a sense a resource, a national or natural resource. And so here's what's done. The income earned by that fund, invested as any fund would be, is distributed to every citizen of Alaska. The same amount each person. That's been going on, as I say, almost 40 years. Now, corporations are so addicted to oil that Alaska just put that addiction to good use, right? The oil companies were like, listen, Alaska, we will suck yo dick for that oil, dog. <laughs> And Alaska was like, oh my God, you have to chill out. Like, please, <laughs> please put your pants back on and stop rubbing your nipples. Please, this is, this is genuinely horrifying. Uh, how about you just give us a bunch of money in taxes for drilling and then you can have the oil. Please stop, please stop touching yourself. Now, <laughs> this, this Alaskan UBI fluctuated, right? It went as high as $2,000 a month or as low as $800 a year. At its height in 2015, when the price of oil was high, it worked out to $2,072 per person, which meant for a family of four, a little bit over $8,000 was simply given to them and to everybody else equally. It's been as low as $800 to $900 per person per year. And the people in Alaska didn't stop working to pursue a career in being a rock star or a fucking ice road trucker reality star. They, those jobs were left for the robots to do, you guys. The robots will be the rock stars now. We don't, we're all so tired. You know, Keith is getting old, you guys. He's getting <laughs> really fucking old. But nobody stopped working. Two professors, Damon Jones of the University of Chicago and Ioana Marinescu of the University of Pennsylvania found that doing this had no effect on employment. Why did they ask that question? Because right-wing critics of these ideas argue that if you give people money just as a citizen, well, then they won't bother to work and we will have people withdrawing from labor. And this research showed, showed crystal clearly that nothing like that happened in Alaska. You gave people money, they didn't stop working or reduce their work commitment at all. But this whole idea of incentive for work is something both Democrats and Republicans bark about all day while letting their owners, the rich capitalists, create more unemployment and homelessness for free, you guys. There's no price on that. Uh, what a deal. But, I mean, the history of Alaska's permanent fund is seldom addressed, and so is the fact that most European countries and Canada have enacted UBI for their citizens during a pandemic, and it's working, right? America is the only so-called first world country that is still trying to means test if helping people financially is a good thing. This, again, is a study that both Democrats and Republicans are pushing for. And it basically turns the poor working class of America into lab rats to see if they are deserving of help from those on high. And study after study has proven that financially helping those in need is a good thing. 
I mean, at this point, this duopoly is trying to manufacture a result to justify their cruelty. Now, for the, those staunch conservatives and neoliberals who believe that receiving help is a sign of weakness that only ends in both physical and mental castration, <laughs> we, we do have other ideas that do very similar things to a UBI, just a, just a little different. The idea would be implemented through social democracy that doesn't deposit cash into a citizen's account, but rather gives the people healthcare, utilities, housing, and food as public services. I like the idea of social democracy uh, as it's applied in real countries in Europe, in the Netherlands, in Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Germany. The idea is everybody has access to publicly financed health care. Everybody has access to quality, publicly financed education, including college tuitions, not a trillion dollars of crushing student debt, but tuitions paid for. Everybody has access to not only guaranteed vacation, but paid vacation. Everybody has access to quality child care so that moms can go to work knowing that their kids are in a healthy, nurturing environment. Everybody has access to maternity leave so that moms and also paternity leave uh, dads can stay home with their kids for several months. It's kind of decent where you say, we have all this wonderful technology, this wealth. Why don't we live decently, not, not miserably? It's decency, it's public services, it's basic needs met. I see it as basically living decent lives in decent societies. They have a very different spirit to them. There aren't a lot of super rich Wall Street hedge fund uh, misanthropes, and I'll use the term advisedly because I find a lot of people on Wall Street don't give a damn about anybody else except they care about their money and I find that really weird. But you don't find that kind of uh, idea in Northern Europe because it's uh, really looked down upon uh, and people don't like it when uh, people are money grubbing, they're kind of shunned. So the social ethos is different. That's right, you heard it here folks. For bailing out Wall Street over the American people, all of Congress and every president should be shunned. Call the power of the Amish, right? <laughs> <laughs> we shun them all. Like I understand the irony of bringing Amish people into a technology-related show. I get it. <laughs> Look, I think we could just take all of Congress and every president, and we shun them and send them to like one of Jeff Bezos's islands, right? Like maybe the one <laughs> where where he silently masturbates while an in intern counts his money for him. Uh, we can send um, them all there. Yeah, he, 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 probably, he probably does that too. Yep. I know. Which so yeah, the Nancy Pelosi image earlier, not that bad, right? You guys, huh? <laughs> not that bad now. No, <laughs> no more. <laughs> no more. <laughs> Look, I, I'm really? sure because there's leaked <laughs> pics, Kit. Don't They're you dare on the interwebs. Don't you dare. So you could. See that billionaire string bean for yourself, man. Oh, God. Again. I believe he, he doesn't call it Jack in it. He calls it Jeff in it. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> oh, 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 my God. Sorry. Sorry. You know, this is the comedy show that I Welcome. thought I was going to get. Yeah. When I Welcome. came in five minutes late. Well, beautiful. <laughs> Look, I get it. There's probably some people that are going to come out and be like, well, you know, is it, is it getting a yeah, UBI just money grubbing, right? Which asking for basic needs isn't grubbing for money. That's, that's like saying a blind person is sight grubbing because they want to see a sunset. <laughs> the difference between the ideas of welfare and unemployment and universal basic income is that under a UBI, no one gets left behind, right? Everybody would be getting a fair share of their needs covered. And of course, everybody wants to know, but where, where's the money going to come from, Chris? Where, I, where, do, where are we going to get all that money from? What are we going to do with all that money? For, 
I, I feel like, look, if the bosses are making the decisions to automate and create unemployment in our society, they can bear some of the burden, right? Oh, you think? Yeah, I know. What a crazy idea. But it was actually proposed in the city of San Francisco as a robot tax, right? The, the tech companies fought against this. And this isn't us directly taxing the robots and, and making them pay for a UBI because then I'm sure we all of a sudden get a bunch of like libertarian robots, right? Like claiming taxation is theft and quoting Ayn Rand all day. And none of us want that. We don't want that. <laughs> here's, here's what the robot tax actually is. That's Jane Kim, a San Francisco city supervisor running for mayor who has proposed a robot tax to help correct the inequality that is now a defining characteristic of the Bay Area. San Francisco has the fastest growing income gap between the rich and the poor of any city in the country. The income gap comparing annual pay between the wealthiest and poorest 20% grew in San Francisco by more than $70,000 in five years. That has made San Francisco into a city with glittering tech towers, fancy cars, and multi-million dollar homes on every street. I want to say that I do think automation is a good thing. It's a positive thing. Um, it's going to increase our productivity, it's going to grow our economy, it's going to you know, help save lives and maybe even fight climate change. Um, but there is going to be a downside um, to this technological progress. Automation is going to further concentrate wealth in the hands of the few who own the robots. Now, this idea is literally no different than Andrew Yang's value-added tax, which would tax tech companies on their wealth as they automate more technologies. Right? This is the same thing. And really think about it. If all the work that was needed in the world was done by one third of the human population, and then automation comes in and drops all that wealth, uh, drops all that work down to 10%, and there was no drop in profit, who's seeing more of that profit? It's the bosses, it's the CEOs, the billionaires, all these, all these rich fucks at the top, right? And they don't give a raise to the rest of the 10% that they do employ. None of the workers get to see that, right? But if we put a UBI in place and tax that enormous wealth that these capitalists are making, then we can even out that playing field. And guys, I did do the math. I did the math on this uh, and I found out uh, that 23% of a fuck ton of dollars is enough to cover the cost of UBI. <laughs> that math actually does check out. Uh, so I didn't even need a calculator to do it. I just kind of figured it out. Now, in reality, the working class should benefit from the fruits of automation, right? If the corporate, corporate profits aren't changing, why not keep the amount of employees you have, pay them the same amount, and cut the workday in half. Isn't that the point of technology? To make our lives easier? To make everybody's lives easier? I mean, the real result of automation should be a little extra leisure for the same pay. Another simple idea to implement is to make sure that, uh, to, to make sure that we don't create a dystopia worse than Terminator Salvation, uh, which is the... <laughs> Yeah, if you don't know which one Terminator Salvation is, it is the cinema where uh, Christian Bale yells at you for two hours uh, and then makes you <laughs> apologize to him. So, <laughs> <laughs> now, if, if we don't, if we don't want to see something worse than that, uh, we could implement worker co-ops, right? Worker co-ops mean that workers own and direct the company rather than having a, a hierarchy of managers and senior managers, and district managers, and senior district managers, and regional managers, and uh, senior regional managers, and global, ma I feel like you guys get it. You guys get the point of, there's too many managers out there. This idea has actually been utilized by several companies all across the globe, right? The largest of these examples is a Spanish corporation called Mondragon, which currently employs over 100,000 people with a family of over 250 worker co-ops within its various industries that they're a part of, from retail, industrial sale, construction, and medical research. The best example of successful worker co-op in the world right now is something called the Mondragon Corporation. This is a, a corporation in Spain, started in 1956 with a Catholic priest and six workers in a poor northwestern corner of uh, Spain. 
Why, this priest made a funny joke one Sunday in church, and he said to his parish, if we wait for capitalists to come down here to, to, to employ us as working people, we will all die of old age before it happens. Everybody laughed, and then he, then he delivered the punchline, which was, let's not wait, let's become our own employers. In other words, let's set up a co-op, which he did in this little town of Mondragon in northern Spain. Okay, fast forward to right now, 2017. Uh, it is the seventh largest corporation in all of Spain. It employs over 100,000 workers. Uh, it is run by those workers who own it, who operate it, who direct it. They are a family of about 250 individual co-ops producing all kinds of goods and services. These worker co-ops also democratize the workplace, right? That means vo workers vote on contract renewals of the managers. Once a year, there's a, I mean, they meet more often, but once a year, there's a big assembly and they decide whether to renew the contracts of the managers they hire. In other words, instead of the managers hiring the workers, it's the workers who hire them. Just try to get your head around that. I'll give you another example. They voted that the highest paid worker in Mondragon cannot get more than eight times the lowest paid worker. Well, in the United States, the, the CEOs get 300 times what the lowest paid workers do. Just to give you an idea, they don't have the inequality that we have, and here's a simple way they've solved that problem. CEOs are making at minimum 300 times more than the lowest paid employee, and Fucking nobody knows what a CEO does, right? Except maybe it's like wear suits and talk shit on the poor. And I, I don't know, like occasionally emails. have emails. Emails. They do, they do some emails. And uh, I guess sometimes they also have parties with sexual deviants that get suicided. They also do that. That's fun for them to do, I guess. And a lot of cocaine. And a, a lot of cocaine. A lot of cocaine. Yeah, they got that cocaine money. They got that good cocaine money. <laughs> Look, a company like Mondragon is also doing so well that it has the ability to set up its own university to help employees and average students figure out how to run their own co-ops and then teach them about the advancements in technologies within all the industries that they work in. Not only does Mondragon grow and is it a successful corporation, but it has set up its own university to train people on how to run co-ops full curriculum, I've been there, I've met those professors. Um, and they've also set up their own laboratories to do research, to come up with new products or to techniques. And two American companies were so taken with the quality of their scientific research that they pay Mondragon to allow their American engineers to work alongside them in their laboratories there in Spain. And I thought people watching or listening to the program might be interested to know that the names of those two American corporations are Microsoft and General Motors. Yeah. Look, capitalist never corporations. Never heard of them. Never, yeah, just a small, <laughs> you guys know the family business of Microsoft and General Motors? <laughs> Here's the thing, capitalist corporations don't do that, right? Capitalist corporations don't help people. They don't do worker co-ops. They just, they put a, a photo of, of the CEO and then they make you pledge allegiance to them and then tell you that, uh, you know, unions will suck the soul of your babies. Uh, uh primarily what American corporations and American corporations don't allow Asian or European corporations to work within our labs or offices, right? Mostly because European and Asian corporations aren't looking to downgrade their employees. You know, in reality, American individualism with the greed and competitive nature of capitalism has made America very unappealing. And it seems like the people that are making America great again are the Spanish. Yeah, it's that old adage. You guys remember that very old adage? No one expects the Spanish corporations. <laughs> They're not all going to be gold, people. <laughs> Sometimes the jokes are just for me. You guys don't need to be involved. <laughs> that's what I wrote <laughs> specifically for myself. 
I I know the words to that song. Well, <laughs> I do. <laughs> Look at a capitalist driven education system like ours, the notion of worker co-ops aren't even discussed, right? Hell, the idea of co-ops in general aren't discussed. I didn't know there were grocery store co-ops till I was like 28, you know? Look, saying that there's only one way to conduct business is assuming that there is only one type of intersection in the world, right? Some of them are gonna be kind of easy. Some of them are gonna be a little bit complicated. Sometimes it looks complicated, but in reality is like super easy. Uh, and sometimes it's just a pile of spaghetti. <laughs> Once again, that is a map of Boston we're looking at there. This is a, a real topographical map of the city of Boston, Massachusetts, you guys. <laughs> guys, Mondragon went from a six-person co-op in 1956 to 100,000 and more employees. And they're self-aware and not greedy, so they talk about whether if that's too large and uh, for, for, for a corporation to sustain something like this, right? So they talk about selling portions of their companies directly back to their employees. And if you're wondering, how would these workers afford to buy an entire corporation? It can be done so pretty easily through public banks and churches. Uh, local churches that see a commitment to the community and to the parishes they serve as including raising money, and that gives you a new ally. Capitalist corporations are more concerned about how much profit they made and, I don't know, what rare animal they can hunt and eat for the sport of it, you know? <laughs> and most capitalists are just like, maybe, this, maybe I'll eat a platypus this week, a, a platypus that's stuffed inside of a duck, you know? Bring, <laughs> bring me a ductopus. <laughs> 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 and guys, that is neither logical nor Christian, okay? I'm pretty sure Jesus was a pescatarian. <laughs> and eating a ductopus is probably some kind of cardinal sin. That's got to be somewhere. It's in there somewhere. Now how can you eat it? How can you eat a poor platypus? You know, it's got a tail of a beaver. It's got a tail of a beaver, a bill of a duck. I mean, you know, it's it's not his fault that he's yeah. a freak of nature, but let's show him already first, you hates know? him. <laughs> like God already doesn't like the platypus. Leave it alone, billionaires. Here's the reality, right? Worker co-ops will completely change the way that we look at work in our culture. It won't be a passive relationship with employment as something we do to buy more shit, but rather something we do to fulfill our lives, better our communities, and the world around us. Now, with automation in mind, worker co-ops would ensure when there's less employment and if your job is replaced, you are still taken care of by the community you worked alongside. I mean, worker co-ops are basically like friends you work with that would also help you move just because they like you. <laughs> it's kind of a big fucking deal, you guys. <laughs> now, author Vivek Vadva claims that automation will mean that we have to rethink capitalism. We need to rethink capitalism itself. And we have another five years, seven years before it gets ugly. But in after, after five, in the five to ten year period, we will start to see turmoil and we will have to start thinking about this. It's time to start learning and adapting right now. And look, there, that is one of the notions that exists within our economic system, right? The notion of human centered capitalism, but it's always torn down by the greed that every capitalist has in the, in the very center of their cash covered hearts. And, and yes, that is a that is a plural in hearts because they have purchased more than one. <laughs> yeah. I look at capitalism as being something pretty much born in the 17th century, roughly in England and spreading from there to Europe and eventually the whole world. And along the way, it has provoked efforts to make it more humane, to make it less harsh, to make it more collected, to make it... Uh, more inclusive, all the things we know about. I mean, look at the New Deal in the 1930s. We really went a long way in this country to create social security, to take care of old people, to, as some people like to say, to create a capitalism with a human face. 
So if you ask me, is it possible to do that? The answer is yes, history teaches it's possible to do that. Unfortunately, history teaches that the capitalists, when you do that, immediately go to work to undo it. I mean, the last 50 years of America have been the undoing of what we call the New Deal uh, coalition and the New Deal programs that happened in the 1930s. Unemployment compensation, Social Security, years later, Medicare, uh, government employment, minimum wage. And we can see literally today the Republicans particularly, but others too, picking away step by step at one or another of these things. So I've learned that what capitalism does is go in a direction that is so provocative for the mass of people that periodically they rise up and push back. And sometimes when they do that, they win and they get something improved. And then they watch as all of that is undone. So at this point, I've said, well, we've tried capitalism. We've tried to reform it. We've tried to prettify it. We've tried to fetter it in various ways to shape it. It doesn't last. We have many things that have undone the victories that we have, we have uh, achieved over the last 50, 60 years, right? We have a right to work state, which grant you the right to work. And, th and that's about it. That's all you get. Uh, you get the right to work. You don't get any health care, no right to decent pay, not even potty breaks, just, just work. And I mean, right to work laws are basically like Jeff Bezos's wet dream come to legislative life. That's all they are. The Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, written by Ohio and New Jersey-based Republicans and approved by Democrat President uh, Harry Truman, undid collective bargaining and depowered the union, essentially granting corporations ownership of their workers. Both Democrats and Republicans continue to demonize socialism at every turn, despite giving handouts to the rich on a daily basis. And now we're living in a world where an entire generation of young people don't look at the word socialism as a dirty word. But then we have an entire generation of like old people that think that it's Genghis Khan level tyranny because they haven't read a book in a while because they're... <laughs> <laughs> nice hat. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's not their fault. You know, they've been working all day for very little pay. It's not their fault. No. No, of course. <laughs> and we've reignited the flames of McCarthyism at every turn, right? If, they, if there's a video of Hillary Clinton calling black people super predators and ignoring a Black Lives Matter activist, well, I mean, clearly that's Russia right there, you know? <laughs> right? If Joe Biden has a mental breakdown over his rape allegations and says something racist and then calls everybody a jive turkey, also Russia. <laughs> yeah, Trump can't get his shit together to take care of people during a pandemic and deny science. Well, that's Russia and China. Oh, <laughs> oh God, yeah. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's a double. That's what we call double McCarthyism in the biz. So, look, capitalism can't be reformed, and it's most certainly not human-centered. Right? The fundamental principle of capitalism is greed and to put a dollar sign on everything. It's a toxic system and the only way to reform capitalism is to leave capitalism, which makes a lot of sense to me as a divorced man. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. great, great analogy, yeah. Mm. Now look at that, I'm like, that's what we gotta, yeah. Somebody start filing the paperwork. <laughs> I know we're pretty good. To <laughs> <laughs> Automation, AI, and algorithm are technological advancements that are, are meant to make the lives of every single person better. Right? Automation, much like Thanos, is inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that joke did better than I thought it would. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought like three people were going to laugh at that, but you guys fucking nailed it. Oh, you fucking <laughs> nerds. Uh. If we render ourselves obsolete, 
only to make a few people richer, then what's the fucking point of advancing technology, right? If we want to avoid a dystopia where the robots take over and want to hunt and kill us because we're awful, then we should strive to be less awful, right? Rather than run a top-heavy economic system hell-bent on being number one against itself, we can run an economy on compassion, logic, and understanding, and maybe, just maybe then, the robots won't want to make flags out of our skin. <laughs> Not a bad idea. But the, person, the, the purpose of humanity can be to create, innovate, and improve each other's lives as a community. Right? We shouldn't have to choose between technological advancements and putting food on your table. That's capitalism asking you to make that Sophie's choice. Okay. Technology partnered with a human-centered economic model can make us a global worker co-op instead of a dystopian nightmare hellscape with a very, very lonely Keith Richards. <laughs> <laughs> the end. Thank you guys so much for hanging oh, out. Oh, Chris. Yeah, thank man. you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well done, well done. And that's been your fork full of noodles for this week. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you did enjoy this episode, please make sure you hit that like button and hit that share button. Get the word out about this episode. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube or on Facebook, uh, it is very likely that topics like this are uh, highly censored. They don't go out to as many people as you think they would go out to. So if you, if you are watching it on those platforms, please make sure you hit the like and the share. It helps me reach uh, more people on that platform. If you're watching this on a different platform, if you're watching this on my Rockfin page, thank you so much. And I hope you consider following me on Rockfin. And if you're not on Rockfin, I highly, go, go check out rockfin.com. Uh, they are a crypto blockchain uh, website that's kind of like Netflix for content creators. They, if for 10 bucks a month, you can uh, check out all of the premium content that every single content per, uh, creator on Rockfin puts out, including myself. You got Graham Elwood, Jimmy Dore, Ron Placone, Hardlands Media. Uh, you got Action for Assange. You got Nico House, Kim Iverson. A ton of folks are on. Uh, Rockfin. So if you are a political junkie, if you like political commentary, if you like political uh, uh, journalism and, and commentary, that's the site for you to go. Uh, so make sure you check that out. Um, I'm going to be doing a bunch of uh, live virtual shows all throughout the fall into the, uh, into the, the winter as well. Uh, it's part of the way that I'm earning my income now that I'm not a full-time touring comedian due to the pandemic. So if you want to come to one of these live virtual shows, you can do so by going to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for being a subscriber. Thank you to all the sustaining members that watch this uh, every single week. I really appreciate it. Till next week, thank you for tuning in.